Producing uh, positive uh, visions of the future, I think, and, and new ideas <clears throat> um, that that can be as inspiring as uh, as the old ones that you're you're talking about. Um, and I think that the old science fiction too still has a lot of of usefulness. Uh, a lot of the ideas that people were discussing uh, 50 years ago about colonization of space and so on are are really as valid uh, today as they were uh, back then. The um, uh, the, the vision of, of the future that we've tended to see, particularly in media, uh, during the last couple of decades, I think, has turned considerably darker, more dystopian. So, uh, uh, in books, in video games, or not in books, but in video games, uh, movies, and TV, uh, uh, almost every depiction of the future that we see uh, is, is pretty gloomy. And, and typically depicts a future in which uh, science and technology have had devastating effects. Uh, I was actually, uh, the other day, uh, browsing for something to watch on my Apple TV, and I went to the science fiction uh, and fantasy uh, section uh, to see what titles they had there, and they had a whole subcategory called Dystopian Futures. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a brand, yeah. Uh, which dystopian future do I want to watch uh, today? And there are reasons for that. There are reasons within, the, the, I think, the, those industries why it's sort of easier and to, uh, to take the world that we've got and break it down and degrade it uh, to create a vision of a possible, uh, a possible future than it is to uh, create a coherent vision of a, of a, a new future uh, from scratch. So I, I understand why it is, um, but I'm hoping that we can maybe turn that, uh, that trend around a little bit and, and try to get uh, some of the more positive uh, depictions of the future uh, uh, out in front of, of uh, the, the next generation of moviegoers and video game uh, players uh, so that they'll have a reason to, to build that future. So, so how do we do that? I mean, why is it that there was a generation where the, those positive visions were part of the popular culture. We, you know, and it's not today. And and and, and maybe Ed and both, either of you some suggestions. What do we do to, to to start creating that into the mass culture? And what role might science centers play in doing that? Well, I'll just throw out that uh, I think that there was a uh, 
uh, a backlash uh, against uh, the kind of sterilized vision of a, a positive future that we would see in, in shows like Star Trek and so on, which, which seem, you know, the original... Backlash. Yeah, yeah. It's the original Trekkie. <laughs> it's, um, the, but if you, if you look at the way people responded to those de depictions of the future in the, the 80s, um, you know, it, it, was, it was definitely a sense that uh, the old kind of Captain Kirk vision of the future was, was really corny and uncool. And what was cool was depictions uh, <clears throat> like we saw in, say, say, Alien, for example, in which that was the first uh, movie that I remember seeing in which we saw kind of the future as an industrial thing with, with uh, in a more, you know, more realistic vein, um, with class conflict and, and military operations going on and uh, a more kind of grimy uh, depiction of the future. Right. I think that was a healthy, that, that, that created a, a sense of realism that sometimes wasn't present uh, uh, in, in the older stuff. But uh, I think it's become a little overdone. Mm -hmm. It'd be time to go a different direction. So I'm um, yeah. yeah, so. You know, what we are trying to do at the Center for Science and the Imagination is, is come up with new stories. You know, I think fundamentally uh, people bought into those stories in the 50s and 60s. It was a different time. It was a simpler world in a lot of ways. It was a world with two superpowers and everybody knew where they stood more or less in relationship to, to that universe. And so it was easier to write science fiction and to imagine a future uh, in that world. Now we have two problems. Uh, the first problem is that uh, we seem to be standing in place. If you watch Star Trek or you watch the Jetsons or you look at futures that we have now, they look basically the same. Jetsons still looks like the future. We don't have our jetpacks. Right. We don't have our, mm -hmm. our, our robo-maids. Um, and, you know, maybe we will soon. We're getting there. Uh, but that future is still the future, so we haven't really gotten there yet. Uh, and at the, at the same time, we're moving incredibly quickly and we don't really know, you know, we're, the, the future is already here in terms of all sorts of incredible bioengineering and uh, new kinds of materials that we don't know what to do with yet. Uh, and so, but it's no longer one singular future. We don't know where we stand anymore and there are too many stories. Uh, so we respond to the fact that the, the present tense has sort of taken over the, the future and the past in the, in the way that Neil was just describing. It's a lot easier to knock down the world than it is to try and imagine a better one. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is come up with new compelling stories that invite people into a plausible, exciting, optimistic, but grounded future, not a pristine, uh, you know, uh, uh, Star Trek future necessarily, but one that still has messiness and, and human emotion and conflict, but that, and that but what, what I like to call thoughtful optimism, you know, not saying oh, the world is absolutely going to get better, everything's going to be fine, don't worry about right. it. Uh, but the optimism that says if we think through all of these possibilities and try to imagine these different futures, if we think of the future as a spectrum of choices, then we're going to make better choices and we're going to get to that better world. I know you guys are working on uh, a project, uh, focused very much on that project, Hieroglyph. You know, can you tell us how that came to be and what that's about? Yeah, this was a completely surprising and unplanned uh, event that emerged from a conference that I went to uh, a couple of years ago where I was sitting on a stage kind of like this one with Michael Crow. Was it this one? It was not this one. Okay. <laughs> but it was a similar kind of uh, environment. And I was there with, uh, with Michael Crow and we got to talking about uh, the, uh, the, this, the, the idea that um, during the first, say, two-thirds of the 20th century, we observed incredible changes in the built environment that we all live in. You know, we, we, at the beginning of that century, we didn't have radio, we didn't have airplanes, uh, we didn't have nuclear power, we didn't have so many other things that became commonplace uh, by the late 60s, early 70s, and then things kind of stopped. So uh, a, a person uh, who sort of stepped into a time machine in 1973 and, and emerged today uh, and looked around would would see 
that uh, you know the cars look a little smaller, a little sleeker, and people carry little weird things around that they tap on all the time. But but the changes in the built environment are pretty minor compared to the ones that would have existed if you did the same thing between say 1900 and 1973. So we got to talking about that and um, the uh, and uh, and about the relevance, if any, of science fiction um, to uh, to those kinds of, of changes. And um, uh, Michael's uh, take on it was that uh, we were falling down on a job, we being the, the science fiction writers. Uh, and um, it, it, if you want, you can think of it as a, a simple sort of cause and effect question. Um, is the, is the, the turn in science fiction towards more skeptical uh, dystopian, gloomy kinds of, uh, of subject matter, uh, a reaction to the, uh, the narrowing down uh, of our future, uh, which is, that's what I had always kind of assumed, but he was proposing that maybe it went the other way, uh, and, and that maybe uh, science fiction actually did have a, a, a cause and effect relationship on, uh, on, on how people think about innovation. So we started to uh, explore that idea in a little bit more detail, and the um, so I'll give you an example of a possible mechanism by which that cause and effect relationship might happen. Now, I, I feel slightly uneasy whenever I do this because it seems very uh, kind of uh, um, presumptuous of me to even suggest that science fiction writers can have this sort of impact, but. As long as we're, as long as, as Crow is making me do the thought experiment, uh, here's here's where I go with it. Um, the um, what I have observed when I hear engineers and innovators talk about how science fiction affected their careers goes something like this. They will cite examples in which uh, a specific piece of science fiction uh, helped an engineering organization get something done kind of in the way that a magnet under a card can cause all the little iron filings to line up. Um, so what happens in a big engineering organization is that ten there tends to be a lot of communication that has to go on in order to ensure that everybody in that organization is kind of working toward the same goal. A lot of meetings, a lot of PowerPoint presentations, and so on. And that is expensive. It is, it is enormously expensive. Um, to have people doing all that communicating. And if it goes wrong, it can be even more expensive. Whereas if everyone uh, has sort of been inspired by a particular vision of the end product, then it kind of automatically causes people to work together in a constructive way towards a, a specific end. So um, with that as, as a premise, we uh, started working uh, on the idea, so sort of a two-headed beast. Uh, one head is the uh, the hieroglyph science fiction anthology. That's the part I know more about, uh, and um, and the idea there was to create some stories that uh, depicted uh, some some innovations that uh, didn't exist yet, but such that uh, a young person graduating from engineering school today could read the story and say, well, okay, this doesn't exist now, but if I start working on it now, maybe by the time I retire, it will exist. And so that means certain things. It, it means, for example, that the stories that we were going to include were, were not going to have uh, hyperspace in them. Hyperspace being a sort of catch-all term that we used for any kind of suspension of the known laws of, whoa, whoa. of science. You're suggesting we're not going to be able to figure that one out? No. No, I think you should, should suggest that we can, and then we might. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I, I wanted to do, let, let me give you an example of, of a story that I did write for it and how it exemplifies the, the idea that I just mentioned. Um, I had been thinking for a while about the idea of building a very tall tower. Uh, as a platform for launching rockets off. Not my idea. Got it from another science fiction writer and physicist named Jeff Landis, who had published on it about 10 years ago. But um, I thought it might make an interesting subject for, for writing this story. Well, it turns out that if you want to build something really tall, it's, uh, it's a fairly straightforward 
thing to, uh, uh, to, to do if you're willing to posit the existence of, of new materials with amazing properties, what we call unobtainium uh, in this sort of context. <laughs> um, that's not what Jeff was proposing to do in his original piece. He was proposing to, to use steel. And I think he was doing that because uh, he didn't want his proposal to be dismissed out of hand as an impractical, oh yeah, we'll get to that in the, the 22nd century kind of idea. So in the story that I ended up writing with considerable uh, assistance from, from uh, some people at Arizona State, um, the thing is made of steel. And that's for a very conscious reason, which is uh, to, to ask the question of, you know, why don't we just go ahead and do this? It's not like we need to invent new materials or new processes. Uh, why don't we just start doing it now? Um, so that was kind of the premise of the idea, the hieroglyph uh, anthology, and um, it was clearly a uh, uh, the, the sort of thing that, um, that I was incompetent to do myself. Um, uh, and so um, Ed ended up um, undertaking uh, the, a lot of the work along with a, a couple of, of colleagues uh, uh, and, and he also is the, the director of the, uh, the other head of that beast, uh, which is the Center for Science and the Imagination uh, at, at Arizona State. So maybe you can talk about the, yeah. the anthology and, and, and explain the, the, the genesis of hieroglyph, I mean, what it means. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'll start with that. So the word hieroglyph is involved here because the idea, as, as Neil and, and a group of other science fiction writers framed it is that there are certain ideas that emerge from science fiction that have become iconic parts of our cultural landscape. Uh, robots, Isaac Asimov, rocket ships, Robert Heinlein, uh, well there's another good example. Satellites. The, the geosynchronous satellite, Arthur C. Clarke. And so what are our new hieroglyph ideas? We've been kicking those around for 50 years or more and how can we come up with them in a way that isn't for, isn't aimed only at readers of science fiction, but at broad audiences and, and fostering broad public debate. And so my, my half of, of this work is, is uh, figuring out how we would do that at a, a, a research institution. So the center is, is, is a research center and we fit within uh, the environment, the ecosystem of Arizona State University, which is a, a fairly weird place. It, it, Michael Crow is the president of ASU, if you're not familiar with that. So, uh, you know, he, he was the other uh, sort of key part of that initial conversation to, to turn this from a spark into uh, an actual fire. And so our mission at the center is to get people thinking more creatively and ambitiously about the future. Very wide open. Uh, we're aiming to communicate with broad public audiences on a number of different levels. And the Hieroglyph Project is a really powerful way to do that, uh, not just uh, in terms of the finished book, which will be, I hope, a book that lots of people read and that will spur lots of conversations, but in terms of the process of writing these stories and having these conversations and drawing in audiences along the way, building a community of people who, who are open to this, who think this way. So to tell the sort of the other side of the story that Neil just told, he was working with, uh, for example, a structural engineer at ASU, uh, Dr. Keith Jelmstadt. And Keith has been a structural engineer for over 20 years. He's literally written the book. And uh, when Neil started emailing with him, I wasn't really sure how this would work, if, if this engineer was gonna be interested in this crazy idea. And he loved it immediately, and he loved it in part because he said in his, his long career in structural engineering, nobody had actually asked the question, how tall could we build something, right? So just th by having this initial conversation with a science fiction writer in the room, you ask questions in a different way. Uh, you pose problems that can't be answered by turning to chapter two and applying a particular set of equations. Uh, and in fact, probably can't be solved by any one person. You need to bring lots of different people together. You need to create interdisciplinary teams. And these are questions, the reason that Keith got excited about this was not just because he thought the project was interesting, but because he could see how it could 
re reinvent the engineering curriculum, which is another something that he's very interested in. Mm. Uh, because this is a problem you can pose to freshmen or to graduate students in a structural engineering program or any other engineering program, and immediately force them to bring creativity and ambitious, out-of-the-box thinking to, to the table. And so it's very powerful to have uh, a network of people who think like this and are having these conversations. And what we've tried to do with Project Hieroglyph is ask everybody to step outside of their comfort zone. So the writers are uh, brainstorming and sharing ideas and collaborating with people uh, before they write the story. And that's not usually how it works and they're doing it in public uh, on a website, hieroglyph.asu.edu. And we're asking our scientists and engineers, students and, and members of the public who are involved, the, the website is open to anybody who'd like to sign up. They're all doing the same thing. They're sharing their ideas, they're talking about work that's happening now, they're speculating, they're taking risks. And some people are, are not ready to do that, and that's okay, they can, they can read the book when it comes out. Uh, but uh, a lot of people are, and this is another way, as, as Neil was saying, this is that magnet underneath the, the paper. It's, it's, so we're finding all of these people who are aligned to this idea. And it's very exciting to see these conversations happen. So you've got a, a captured audience of uh, science center professionals. How can, what do you think the role of informal science education in science centers is in, in your work, um, in maybe explaining a little bit about the intersection between science and science fiction? Just sort of broadly, any thoughts on that? How can we help you do what you're trying to do? Well, I'll just give some personal anecdotal responses. Uh, I, I don't know that much about, about what you all do for a living, but I can well, tell you. we got to fix that. Well, I can tell you that uh, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I would visit Seattle every summer. Um, we would drive out and visit family there. We would go to the Pacific Science Center. and. Um, there were some displays there that I still remember very clearly, and they were uh, old school, simple analog physical uh, devices. There was one that would produce a normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve, by basically hurling balls at random into a box, and they would fall into vertical slots and eventually pile up a, uh, a bell-shaped curve. Uh, and I would stand and watch that for, for hours. And another one is a rotating uh, table that um, it was full of fluid and had a, a glass top. You could spin it around, you could see how the fluid moved inside of it. And um, you could see patterns in that fluid. I didn't know the names for them at the time, but as I got older, I understood that what I had been learning about was the distinction between laminar and turbulent flow. And um, another thing that I learned about that as I got older was that it's such a computationally difficult problem to solve that uh, you probably couldn't make a decent uh, computational equivalent of that simple device uh, if you tried. Um, so, um, so for me, uh, the, the, the stuff that, that sticks in my mind and that I, I think might stick in the mind of, uh, of a lot of people who, who go to these centers uh, tends to be the more hands-on stuff, the, the physical uh, things where you can actually see scientific principles at work. Um, and, um, and in a way, that's, that is what's special now. So, so uh, anything that, that is on a screen, you can interact with electronically, uh, is, is an everyday thing. It used to be marvelous, it used to be unbelievable, and now People see it every day, and what they don't see every day is is the physical world uh, in action. So that's my personal bias. Uh, I've already belabored Bryce uh, in the past with uh, with my opinions on that. So out of mercy to, to him, I'll, uh, I'll 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 stop at this point. <laughs> what else don't you like about no. him? <laughs> so. I think this is exactly where the Center for Science and the Imagination needs to be. Uh, we're, and we're very excited to be collaborating with, with Chevy and, and others at the Arizona Science Center and, and starting to create tangible experiences of some of these future ideas. Because, you know, this is what happens when you put someone with a PhD in English in charge of something like this, right? It's all about stories. And uh, the reason that science fiction is so effective at, for example, saving you hundreds of hours of PowerPoints and meetings is that 
A good story invites you in. A good story is not a schematic. It doesn't detail every last bolt and uh, piece of wiring. Uh, and in fact, the reader or the listener does a huge amount of the imaginative work in flushing out the universe, right. flushing out the world, right? So a good story invites you into a world. And that's what a good exhibit or installation can do in a very concrete way, is to let you step into a future world, play around with ideas like design, <coughs> fiction, uh, different kinds of prototyping, to actually experience, to hold in your hand some, some piece of the future that can illustrate the things we know now. And so uh, I'm very excited. I think that uh, that's a, the most, you know, the, the, the most creative and fun way that we can start to reach new audiences with our work, uh, moving beyond uh, film and moving beyond books. Interesting. Um, I, I was I, I, in just getting to know you and learning a little bit more about your background, um, how much you did predict in your work. Um, and uh, I, I'm just curious, obviously you think about the future. Um, what, what should we be worried about that we're not worrying about right now? Hmm. Um, I think that uh, when, um, when we address this, this question of uh, why isn't society undertaking big uh, ambitious projects, at least in the physical domain, uh, the way we used to. Um, it's the, the the first thing that comes to mind is that it's something to do with the STEM world. That somehow it's not enough engineers, or uh, um, we don't have the innovative uh, or uh, spirit or technical uh, genius that we once had, and I'm less and less certain that that is actually the, the case. I actually, uh, and more and more of the data points that come to me suggest that, uh, that it, the, the problem, the deficiency doesn't lie there at all, and that it, it lies more uh, in the, the sectors of the society that uh, are the, the financial world, uh, people whose job it is to uh, to invest in things and to put to, to risk money on new projects, uh, the people who manage organizations, um, the uh, our, our overall uh, mentality around taking risk and around uh, attempting to do new new things. Uh, scientists, engineers, they're all for it, um, but. Uh, the, the thing that, that I'm increasingly certain is the, the problem uh, is, is in uh, kind of our leadership class, our management class, our financial class. Uh, and um, I don't know if that is uh, something that's addressable through the, the mechanisms that everyone in this room is, is conversant with, but uh, who knows, maybe uh, we can uh, get them uh, in, inspired to, uh, to start thinking a little a little bigger uh, in what they do for a living. Okay, one last question. I'm going to open it up to the floor. Is this all real, or are we just uh, living out some metaverse fever dream that you've had? Well, the the best uh, the the best person on that I think is David Deutsch, uh, who wrote a uh, he's written a, a couple of, of books. He's an Oxford uh, physicist, um, but um, the, 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 the point that, that he makes, which I think is interesting, is that, um, is that uh, there are certain uh, phenomena that uh, to simulate them you would require so much computing power. I'm going to completely butcher his argument, <laughs> so you'll have to go. It's called the fabric of reality, uh, if you want to see what he actually said. Um, but um, uh, the, the amount of computing power you would need to fake it uh, is just sort of bigger than the universe itself. So that's kind of the, the best proof that it's not a fake. <laughs> God, I feel so much better. All right. Um, questions from the floor? Yes, this gentleman right here. And maybe if you can shout out or get a mic to him, what are we going to do? We have microphones. We got mics coming. I, I, I would propose to, yeah, that never works. Yeah, just shout and we'll repeat. Yeah, because yeah, it'll take too much time. Okay. Shout. So, talking about... Talking about the, uh, the, the rate of change, mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things that I think is that um, human energy gets focused on different kinds of technologies in different epochs. So really early, we were all about agriculture. Then we were about the architecture of castles and churches and cathedrals. Then we were all about stationary machines that made the mills. Then we were about the moving machines that got us from you know the locomotive to the moon landing. Lately, we've been all about nanotechnology and, and information technology, really, but the, yeah. the micro of information technology. Fair enough. And I think that human creativity keeps being applied to all of these different areas over time, but we send the best and the brightest to the area that we think is sexy right now. And so that's the area that booms forward. And I'm kind of feeling like the information technology is starting to plateau, and I'm getting really curious what the next explosive growth epoch is going to be. Well, I, I, you know, my my hope is that um, is that in a hundred years we kind of look back on this and say, oh well, um, this thing happened where everything got turned into a an information problem, and we just had to basically hit. We had to, 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 to stop working on everything else for uh, a generation or two while we just basically absorbed information technology uh, into everything that we did. Um, and then at a certain point, we hit the point of diminishing returns on that, and then we moved back out into other pursuits. Uh, and we began to, 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 to build things that move, or machines, or, or agriculture, or, or what have you, but in a new way that was informed by the, the advances that we achieved uh, during that, that kind of revolutionary uh, era. Uh, and I, I like to tell myself that we can see uh, signs of that starting to happen when we see the, the move towards, towards 3D printers and uh, um, and, and, and other ways of, of putting IT to work uh, that, that go a little bit beyond kind of the more trivial apps and so on that, that seem to have occupied a lot of people's attention recently. Yeah, when you look at the, uh, the, the gulf, it's never been larger, the gulf between uh, the things we could do right now and the things we actually and, you know, come up with to do, the, the applications we come up with for these technologies. So when you think about things like ubiquitous computing, potentially ubiquitous manufacturing, uh, there's, I think there's gonna be a huge amount of, of work in creating better relationships between humans and computers. When you talk to people at uh, places like Intel, they're interested in perceptual computing and a computer that knows whether you're sad or happy, interested or bored. Uh, and that's gonna have really profound transformations that no longer feel like information technology, uh, innovations that are going to feel like uh, everyday life being transformed as this, this sort of digital fabric permeates everything. Don't be intimidated, you can ask a question. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Um, I'm curious if you see any connection between the lack of teaching of the arts to young children and creativity and the advancement of science. This is something that I'm really interested in and uh, as, as someone who, who has some, some, you know, kind of dusty STEM credentials, but is primarily uh, a, a humanities person, I'm very interested in making sure that the work that our center does is not defined as STEM or STEM plus something else, or, or art science, which I think, again, ends up reiterating these divides even by, even as it tries to unite them. And so that's why I chose this word imagination, because I think it's an open territory that uh, physicists and artists and writers uh, and engineers all feel invited into. It's something that we all need to use to be successful in, in our professional careers. And so I, I think that uh, some, of, some of the students who are most excited about what we're doing are engineering students who come and say, I didn't know I was allowed to write science fiction stories or do something creative like what you're doing this event. Mm -hmm. and, I think that's really telling. I think that you know there is uh, a very important place for the arts and the humanities uh, 
in all of these conversations about educating our workforce, about uh, fostering creativity, about uh, opening new pathways. And when you talk, when you look at successful people in any field, they always end up crossing these boundaries anyway. Yeah, I don't have a lot to, to add other than some general ag agreement with, with that. I mean, the, um, uh, the, just to name one example that I'm most familiar with, I think that the ability to, to tell a coherent story um, is uh, an, important, uh, an important function in, uh, in being able to, um, to, to make a plan for an engineering project or, or for anything else. And that the, the faculties that you have to bring to bear to make a story internally consistent and have, make it have a beginning, middle, and end and organize your thoughts are, are directly ap applicable to that. Not that that's the only reason you should study the arts, but, but uh, I do think that they're related. Yep. Hi. Um, it seems to me on this, on the business of why we aren't getting um, uh, the kind of narratives of the future in science fiction is that we already got here and the world turns out to be the world that Philip K. Dick, Sam Delaney, William Burroughs and J.G. Ballard were predicting uh, while the space race got cut before we, by budget cuts before we got out the gravity well. Um, and so trying to sort of, pr uh, you know, throw a... Um, a vision of a uh, heroic future through writing uh, seems kind of silly when you've got that uh, um, behind you. And the narrative for the future seems now to be pushed by people creating the digital realm, and they're doing that faster than people can write books. Um, what do you think about that kind of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that, Neil? Where are you? <laughs> I know, I saw, I'm looking for him too. He's back there. Oh, there oh okay. <laughs> Okay, well, well I, I certainly think it, it would be silly to, uh, to write one specific piece and, and say that this is the, the future. So uh, what we're doing with, uh, with Hieroglyph uh, is, is to try to get as many people writing. It's kind of a shotgun approach. Uh, maybe one of these things will, will prove useful uh, in some way. Um, so um, the... Uh, I mean, I, you, you can find, um, you, it, it, it's, 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 it's a useful point to make that, that some of the, the, the visions of your sort of less hard SF writers um, uh, may have come true a bit more effectively than the, the kind of classic uh, sort of let's go to space and build space colony uh, vision. Uh, that, that we associate with, with kind of the Amazing Stories brand of, 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 of classic hard SF. Um, I, I, uh, I don't think that that's a reason uh, to just sit around and, and wait for things to, to happen. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, a lot of the, um, the, the work to which very bright people are now being put in the tech industry is silly, right? So, so there are plenty of people who, in a previous generation, you know, would have been been uh, doing doing great deeds, who are um, instead um, writing you know silly little apps, uh, and um, that's a, a function of the the marketplace rewarding them for doing that. So I don't. Uh, I, I understand why they, they make that decision, um, but um, uh, it, it, it seems to me that, um, that, that some of these things are kind of humiliatingly inconsequential compared to the intellectual power that, that some of these people have, have got going for them. Uh, so uh, it, it, it may be that what we're doing uh, isn't really going to be, be useful, but it seems as though it's harmless to at least try to present uh, pictures of, of, of greater things that, that that intellectual horsepower might be, might be devoted to. Thank you. We've got one in the back over here. We can see you, sort of. Uh, great, great comments and inspiration. Thank you. Um, and I like your idea that uh, things haven't changed in the last 50 years, but we have added a few billion people to the planet. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the 
future since there's supposed to be a couple billion more coming in the next 25 years? Um, I guess I'm personally sort of in the, the camp that's, that's not all that um, worried about, about population. Um, so I'm, I'm more worried about what the population does and, and how they, they, they live. And, and clearly, uh, they need to start living in, in a, a way that doesn't impact the environment uh, as much as it does now. Um, you might be interested to know that Ed and I were at a conference in May uh, where we saw a presentation by Bob Zubrin, who's a famous thinker about space colonization. And um, he presented, he sort of took this argument to the max. He presented an argument that uh, was based on the idea that if we're going to build a starship, um, it's going to be so expensive that if its cost represents the same percentage of gross domestic product as the Apollo program represented of American GDP in, uh, in the late 60s, that we would have to make the economy a thousand times bigger. So um, he started uh, trying to think of ways to make the economy a thousand times bigger and came to the conclusion that we need lots more people living a lot closer together because <laughs> Those things have been correlated in the past with uh, economic uh, hmm. with economic growth. So uh, uh, I, I'm not uh, necessarily endorsing his his argument, by the way. Uh, but um, but just as a as a kind of a note of interest, you might you might want to check out his uh, his. Uh, I, I assume that, that all that stuff is kind of streamed on the on the internet now. Another. Uh, Common along those lines is that we'll we need to make better decisions. You know, we need to get people together uh, and find more efficient ways to use resources. Become more aware of our communities and what's happening around us. Uh, and this is something that uh, a number of my colleagues at ASU work on regularly. But it also reminds me of another one of our stories from the Hieroglyph Collection by Carl Schroeder, which explores exactly this idea. What if you used these new uh, augmented reality technologies, things like Google Glass, to actually start to see the impacts of your choices and the, the relationships of different systems around the world. So you could see how much, what the carbon footprint of different buildings and industries around you were and how people are uh, collaborating in, in political structures. Uh, and so I do think things like that are going to become more uh, prevalent. We already have versions of that with, with Twitter and Facebook and knowing what people, our, our group of people, whatever that is, might be doing at this moment all around the world. Uh, and I think that kind of cultural proprioception, the sense of our extended cultural self, is going to become more and more important. And that's the only way I think we can realistically deal with these growing stresses. So I think that's a perfect note on which to end and to thank our wonderful guests. Thank you.